what we have for you is a pretty standard presentation that we give um, when we have open houses that goes through a lot of the different features and opportunities in the industry. So we'll just go ahead and get started. Kind of maybe why you're here. Um, I like to remind students and families that um, what, what we're ultimately trying to do, and I, and I love this quote, uh, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. I think it's it's no secret that going and getting some secondary education uh, just opens up doors that you would not have access to, and we see that. So we meet with a lot of parents and their prospective students, and it's pretty obvious sometimes that the most nervous person in the room is the parents, trying to understand what is my son or daughter going to potentially do with this degree. I think it's a pretty misunderstood field, and I try to remind them that uh, this is a massive industry and so these are some old numbers and we could probably debate all day about where these numbers actually fall but there's 50 million managed acres of turf grass in the united states it makes it either the third or fourth largest crop uh, depending on how it's categorized and then this is really where we get into uh, some differences in numbers but we've seen numbers published anywhere from 40 to 60 billion up to 147 up to 147 billion dollars so there's a lot of opportunities within the industry uh, to, to move around and find jobs. So a lot of times parents are always saying, what is, what is my son or daughter going to do with this degree? Are they just going to mow lawns? And so we'll get into what those particulars are. Uh, Ed, do you have anything to add when you kind of see those things? Well, when we talk to the parents, it's, it's more about uh, getting to understand that, you know, th their mentality and what they're perceiving the industry to be is very different to what, to what the reality is. Uh, you know, you're looking at, for instance, a lot of families will be thinking about something like landscape as being part of it and it's just a guy out mowing the grass. But we know from a multitude of people who own their own companies that it's managing human resources. It's managing large budgets. It's managing a lot of, of financial wherewithal. Uh, and so, you know, when we're looking at the kids coming in here, we're looking at kids who are, are rounded, professionally developed, and they are thinking about uh, implications of developing serious industry type business. Uh, the most common question that I get from from parents and students when they come to visit is the two year versus four year degree. And uh, if my son or daughter comes and gets a, a two year degree here at Ohio State ATI, and I, I would like to just mention that this is a degree. It's a transcripted degree. So there are other programs out there that are more of what we would call a certificate that uh, it's very specialized training much like it is here but ours is unique that's there's not many programs in the country that give you a transcripted two-year degree so we Ed and I teach the uh, in the two-year associate of applied science degree and then there's a lot of institutions including our Columbus our Columbus campus that can offer you a four-year bachelor's of science degree and so parents want to know which is better for my students and unfortunately, we don't have a crystal ball. I think we would tell you that it is most certainly a case-by-case -case basis about which, case, you know, which degree would benefit a student more. I think we all can agree in this room that more education is certainly always going to be a good thing. Certainly in this day and age, more education costs you a little, quite a bit more money. And so that's one thing. But I guess when I think about the, the two degrees, two-year versus four-year degree, and we can do some pros and cons here. Pros, at least when I think about our program from a technical turf grass management standpoint, I would put our degree up against any other degree. Um, I think we've both said that we teach and learn things here that I never learned in, in my four-year degree. I mean, it's a we kind of take this approach. What are you going to use in the industry? Because that's what we're going to teach you. There are plenty of things that I learned uh, getting a four-year bachelor's of science degree that I don't teach here. And I'll tell you why I don't, because I never used them. I worked in the industry for nearly 10 years, and I just did not use, um, I did not use that information. Um, so things that we see, two-year, four-year. So two-year, from the technical turf grass maintenance standpoint, we're right there on par, I think, with almost everyone else. And if not, I would argue sometimes above. Oh, communication. This is really where we think the two, the two degrees are a little different. Um, communication is a huge part of this industry. Um, it's probably the piece that students understand the least or don't appreciate how much they will need uh, to have good written and oral communication skills. 
And so you take writing classes here, you take some public speech classes here at Ohio State API, but I think with a four-year degree, you're, you're exposed to more classes like that where you're giving presentations. I think you begin to feel more comfortable in your own skin as you uh, move through those studies. Liz, do you have some questions? Not that I know of. Okay. Well, I'll keep plugging away here. Um, and just to add to that, the other thing we've noticed is for a student who take a four-year degree, um, that uh, th there's more development on maturation as well. We do find that some of our students, uh, when they get to the age of 19 to 20, they probably, even themselves, feel like that they could do a little bit more as far as um, uh, maturation. And so while we get one internship in, uh, sometimes the second internship is really a beneficial uh, component to it. So again, like Zane said, we don't necessarily think that everybody should do one or everybody should do the other. It really is a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and, and, and we've asked, industry uh, people <clears throat> who have completed both four and two-year programs and we've had widely varying answers for instance the two-year guy said straight away he wished he had done a four-year degree the guy who completed a two-year and a four-year degree said he thinks he would have been just fine with a two-year degree and so it's it, again very much a case-by-case -case basis yes and i think to ed's point depending on what age category you sit in as you're watching this presentation when you think about the maturation that occurs from 18 to 20 versus, you know, 20 to 22, um, it's huge. And I also think, too, that uh, gives you time to develop what you truly want to do. But back to the, the two-year degree, one, it's just two, two less years of college. So from a financial standpoint, it's good. The students who just excel with the two-year degree are the students who are driven, who know what they want to do, are coming in here, working hard, getting this technical training soaking it up and then they're prepared to go out into the into their professional world and just grab the bull by the horns if those students we said it they'd be successful with any degree it really uh it really is a case-by-case -case basis but um so to kind of wrap it up in summary pros of the two-year degree um we see that it's cheaper we think you're getting by far uh, superior technical training um, Pros of the four-year degree, a little bit more writing, communication skills, um, but again, you know, you're going to pay for it, for well, sure. Do you have anything to add to that, Ed? Uh, the, the maturation, for sure, on the four-year degree, and, and I think also just time to develop a network. I think that probably is something why Zane and I have a, a strong network in the industry. You know, as students start to mature, they understand what that means. And so I think they develop a little bit more with that network capability, mm -hmm. particularly again with the internships, right? Because the more people you get exposed to across multiple internships helps you gain a greater network. Yeah. So that's part of it as well. I think we're very fortunate too. I mean, Ohio is a hardworking blue collar state and we see that in our students. We see students who just, they want to come, they want to get this hands-on education because they're ready to just go out into the professional world. And, and start working so it's a it's a perfect storm so we talked about some of the technical <clears throat> training that you will receive so there's no shortage of technical courses that you will take within our program we're going to teach you equipment operation and maintenance skills so knowing how to operate the various pieces of equipment understanding then how to perform basic maintenance teaching you how to, to grind reels and bed knives change fluids belts um, troubleshoot you know any kind of electrical problems seat safety switches Poor ignition, uh, is it a spark compression fuel issue? Uh, Dr. Nagel here teaches our fundamentals of turf grass science. So that's a basic turf course, teaching about all the various species, how to manage them from a mowing, irrigation, fertilization, a little bit of pest control. We would consider that to be our 100 foot view, giving you a real large overview of what turf grass science is. Uh, I teach a course called Golf and Sports Turf Irrigation and Drainage. So teaching you the different facets of drainage in terms of tile spacing, depth, tile configuration, drainage design, um, understanding soil plant relationships, and then from the irrigation standpoint, understanding how do you calculate water use, water sources, pumps, fittings, heads, electrical, the whole kit and caboodle. And then we have soil science, principles of weed science, talked by our other counterpart, Dr. Dan Volz. Uh, Dr. Volz is a walking plant encyclopedia, and so you're learning from one of the best there to take a entomology, the study of insects, 
plant diseases of ornamentals and turf. So having a little bit of uh, understanding about what are some of those diseases that will attack ornamentals as well as turf. That's also taught by Dr. Dan Boltz. Uh, turf grass cultural systems and practices. This is a course that I teach. This gets in, I think, a little bit more into the, the turf grass selection. So I always tell parents to put it in layman's terms that, you know, you drive around the state of Ohio and you're going to see a lot of fields of corn. It's all ZMAs. It's all the same species, but certain cultivars have been picked for irrigated upland corn. Maybe it's 30 inch spacing or 36 inch spacing. So same is true in our industry where we actually begin to pull out specific cultivars, specific species, put the right plant in the right place. And you get all your math in that course as well for calibrating spreaders, sprayers, et cetera. And then we teach you a course called golf course and sports field organization management. This is where we get into the finances of how to run budgets and build programs, et cetera. So that's a small tidbit of some of those technical courses. Liz, do we have any questions? So far, so good. So far, so good. We're hopefully answering them as we go here. So, um, you know, again, we get two-year, four-year degree questions. What is the industry? And so ultimately, people want to know if I come get this degree, what am I going to do with it? Is there going to be a job? waiting for me and certainly we see that absolutely so just to give you an idea of what some of our graduates have done um, this is ryan demay um, ryan is a osu ati grad he um, worked in the golf course industry was actually a golf course superintendent and and made a shift so he is now the um, the director of operations for berliner sports park he manages sports fields down in columbus and so he is a gentleman who you know was headed one direction decided to make a shift and is in the sports turf world. Here you see Renee Geyer pictured on the right. Uh, Renee is the superintendent of the North Course at Firestone. Don't quote us here, Renee, we think it's the North Course, but uh, Renee is one of those students who, who has just loved the golf industry, has went down this path and been immensely successful. Now, uh, here you see Jason Mall. Jason came to us as a, a non-traditional student. He had worked, I think he had worked in a factory for several years and then, uh, Came back, got a degree here at Ohio State ATI in turf grass management, and he's now the uh, golf course superintendent of Moraine Country Club, which has just underwent a massive renovation, a phenomenal golf course. Um, and so again, he is a, he's at the pinnacle of, of what the golf course industry is. Uh, here you see Charlie Erlenbach. This is, picture is a little old. Charlie was a he was a landscape student, took some turf grass management classes, uh, used connections that Dr. Nangle had uh, to get. Uh, his first job opportunity at the Cleveland Browns. He has since moved. He is now the head groundskeeper for the Lake County Captains. Is that a single A baseball facility? A single A baseball facility. And so, you know, opportunities are endless. And then uh, um, this gentleman here is Mr. John Prusa. Uh, for those with the entrepreneurial spirit, uh, John is just a shining example. John worked in the lawn care industry, um, ran several lawn care companies. And now he's actually manufacturing right in Stowe, Ohio. He's right on spreader sprayers. And so, you know, you can, John, I just love as an example. We have a lot of students that want to be entrepreneurs, that want to run their own small businesses. You will get that kind of training, how to, to run a successful small business in our program. We, we do have one question. It's not necessarily related to the uh, class. It's regarding... A uh, recommendation for turf grass to plant on a sloped hill under tree shade in the Chicago area. Uh, something that may not require mowing if native. Uh, I would respond with uh, creeping red fescue. Strong creeping red fescue would probably be your best bet. Uh, knowing the Chicago area though, it would need to be on somewhat of a drier type of soil. So um, you're also going to need to help that establish. Uh, some type of nursery crop, so you might want to mix that initially with annual ryegrass, which would die out, and no more than 10%, no but allow for that creeping red fescue then to establish. This also brings up a good point. If you get a degree in turf grass management, there will be no shortage of phone calls and text messages from family members asking for free turf grass help, so that comes with the territory. <laughs> <laughs> and the neighbors. Yeah, and the neighbors. No other questions? Here? No. Okay. So some of the employment opportunities, I'll just give you a quick, you know, we've listed a lot of uh, different positions that are here, but we see in general, we could lay 
our students into four broad categories. So we think about right now we have about 40 students in our program and about 50% of those students are interested in, in working in the golf course industry. Most aspire to become a golf course superintendent. Um, and so that path is going to look like uh, some type of assistant in training to a, a first or second assistant and eventually a golf course superintendent. So 50% of our students want to work in the golf industry. About 30% of our students want to work somewhere in the sports field industry, whether that be the MLB, MLS, NFL, Parks and Rec. Figure any division one, two, three schools going to have a lot of sports facilities to manage. And so our students are interested in that sports field component. Um, about 10% of our students uh, want to work in the lawn care industry. Some want to run their own lawn care business. Uh, some want to work for a larger company like a Davy Tree or a True Green. And then we have 10% of our students that are kind of floating in the abyss a little bit of those that, that they're, they're interested in all of them. They're kind of waiting till the end to make that decision where they, they think, I just like to be outside. I like to work with my hands. I like the in, instant satisfaction. That's one thing about the turf grass industry, I think, is that um, you have something tangible to look at and touch when you're done with a, a hard day's work. And, and that's that can be a little addictive. It was for me. And so we have a lot of students that just kind of gravitated towards that, whether they mowed lawns in high school and can see themselves in the profession, but aren't quite sure which way to go. So, and we, we try and help as much as possible at the start of the, the, the semester of the first year. Uh, we'll take the students on visits to the golf courses. We'll take them on visits to the Browns or to Pittsburgh Pirates. We went last year. And we also try and take them out to a lawn care landscape operator with the idea being that they get to understand, you know, the lifestyle, what the expectations might be. And, and you know, Zane mentioned Charlie Erlenbach. That visit actually was what mm -hmm. kind of converted Charlie from the standpoint of he was interested in landscape, but he ended up moving over to work in sports fields. And so, you know, we understand that not all the students are 100% focused and fixed on what they want to do. So those types of visits we feel offer value to them for at least getting them started where they think they need to go. And, and I think Ed and I, we, we spend a lot of time working with our students one-on-one, -on -one, trying to get to know them. They actually take a class here their first semester uh, called Exploring Horticulture, which is just all about what is the turf grass management industry? What different opportunities are there? And because every student here at the end of their first academic year is going to go out and do an internship. So not at the end of your schooling, you're going to do it right up front. And so we try to get a feel for what does that student ultimately want to do? If we have a student that says, hey, I want to be a head groundskeeper, uh, at an MLB facility, then we want to get them an internship that gets them working at the MLB, whether or not it's right at the uh, MLB level, but maybe it's down in the AAA or AA, but still uh, getting those skills. And we, we often do see that some students aren't sure or they go do an internship in one field and they come back and say, hey, I was good, but I think I would like to, to check a different route. We do a post-graduation internship, but um, just in general of our role here, I don't know about you, but that's a piece that I take pretty seriously. I, I really think that teaching our classes is one thing, um, but if there's a lot of relationships, that network, we want to make sure our students are set up to be as successful as possible. And so it's not something I see in a flyer anywhere that we can publicize, but just know that we work our butts off to try and make sure that our students are getting the best opportunities possible. Um, and then it's up to them. You know, we'll, we'll lay it out there for them, but they're the ones that ultimately have to work hard and make it successful. So we put up some other jobs and you can see it. this is kind of more for our state here in Ohio. We have a great sod industry. So there's a lot of opportunities uh, working on solder farm, whether it be, you know, an operations manager or supervisor. Uh, we talk about our sports field managers. I kind of think of those as your MLB, MLS, NFL. Um, Parks and recreation. So this is a growing field for us. We see that the any of you drive around anymore, there's no shortage of youth sports being played. And there, there's being more asked of those fields than there ever has been before. So you go to some of these soccer tournaments, uh, some of those fields receive several months worth of traffic in the matter of a couple days. And it, it now is requiring a professional, someone with some professional training to keep those fields safe. And so we see that these are, this is a growing part of our, of our industry. Obviously mentioned the lawn care operator. And so, one thing when I see students that come in for lawn care, I think a lot of students come in wanting to, to do the mowing piece, 
Um, but we teach them far more. You know, we teach them how to select good turf grass species to plant the right part in the right place. So when you think of a business, now you're doing uh, renovation as a service you can add. Pest control, we're going to teach you all the different facets of pest control, insects, weeds, diseases, proper products, proper timing, proper application, uh, personal protective equipment, and how to be good stewards. So, you know, I'm a believer in IPM. It is a, it's a last gate piece. And so um, teaching you how to put out different fertilizers as a, you know, maybe a sales or distributor. You could get into the consulting role, although this is something for most of our students would be maybe later in their careers. Um, and the private and academic researcher, we have technicians who work with us and other places around. So these are opportunities as well. Ed, uh, other things that are listed there that you could, you know, for sure we've got examples of that are ATI graduates, uh, construction co company managers, uh, and that's an experiential type uh, component, but they would have a two year turf degree. Um, uh, uh, people who are working with um, golf associations or agronomists on the PGA Tour, things like that. There's a range of backgrounds uh, that you would find that people have um, that we just, you know, we also can never say for sure uh, where people will always end up. But what we also tend to see is that with two-year type degree, people may put a business qualification with it, and this propels them into those other situations. Um, and so that has been something where we found people that are coming to us and saying, hey, I'm a national accounts manager for such and such a company, and you're going, really? And, it, and I'm an ATI graduate. And it kind of is like a pretty impressive uh, story to hear on how they've ended up there. It's unbelievable to me, just the, the people that we have out there in the industry that graduated from our program. I always tell our students, you're, you're in a fraternity now, very successful people, and we take care of our own. So um, I think that's probably true of anywhere. A piece that we wanted to focus on a little bit, so that was the things that we went through there really focused on our, our two-year Associate of Applied Science degree in turf grass management. But um, Dr. Nangle here is the coordinator for our equipment manager certificate. So what an equipment manager is, this was a need that we heard. And this is really focused a lot on, on towards the golf course side of things. So it is not uncommon for a golf course to have several million dollars worth of equipment. And that fleet of equipment needs to be maintained just like any other fleet of equipment which from a preventative maintenance standpoint, a curative maintenance standpoint, and then really as we're showing here, just the, the basic sharpening of some of that specialized equipment uh, takes special tooling and takes special training. And so we have a one-year equipment manager certificate. What that is, a very specialized program where you come in and take one year of intensive training, and then you would be prepared uh, to go out and work as an assistant equipment manager and, and potentially depending on what kind of mechanical aptitude you have even potentially be uh, the lead equipment technician at, at a golf course facility um, or a road tech of some sort for a distributor and so this is pretty unique not many places can offer a degree like this simply because they don't have the facilities like we have here at ohio state api so uh, our engineering technologies department this degree is almost really a joint degree where you're getting some of your training from myself Dr. Nangle, and then you're getting uh, a good amount of the, the equipment training with our engineering technology staff. And these are just, these are people who have been turning wrenches, they're engineers, uh, you know, 50 years worth of, uh, of training. So, you know, we'll teach you the diesel mechanics. So I think this is, our, I don't think this has, so we have, I think this is the older diesel. We have one right beside it that has all the tier four emissions, but you'll get the diesel training. Um, I'm a kid in a candy store. I walk down there. Students have uh, blocks torn apart where they're blueprinting, uh, blueprinting uh, engine blocks, you know, miking, bearings, and clearances. So good training there. You'll take a welding course. So every student uh, in this will take a welding course, learning how to phrase, uh, mig, tig, stick. Um, other parts of this part of the degree, uh, a big focus though. And this degree is the real mower maintenance and sharpening. So we have a class specifically designed, the Dr. Angle designed, um, where it's all about how to properly set up real cutting units, how to disassemble, how to sharpen, how to troubleshoot, uh, how to diagnose poor after cut appearances. And so that is the bread and butter, really the cornerstone of that entire course is getting that specialized training from our, our adjunct instructor, Dr. Or not Dr. Mr. Gary Bubdansky, he's like a doctor. The guy is brilliant. 
Um, but he is an equipment manager, what, 30 years of experience does he have? And so you're learning from one of the best there. And then we do have one question. Uh, as far as the equipment management certificate being only on site or something that could be done remotely online, as it currently stands, that is only on site. We are working on condensing uh, the certificate into a four year, a four week program that would run during the summer. However, uh, we do feel that the extent of the um, the training that you get in this certificate over the year-long program really is high quality. And uh, to, to, to really emphasize it, this real grinding class, we're not sure if there's a transcript of real grinding class anywhere else in the country, mm -hmm. right? That, that, that is a, a critical component. What we've also seen is that we do see students who will come in to do the two-year AAS degree and will add the certificate on to it. Generally, if the students are staying on schedule, they're going to only need an extra semester to get that certificate added to it. Um, and it really does add value to them going out the gate. We've already had one example where uh, locally the, the student went and uh, within a year he was hired as a, he, he went in as an assistant and within a year he was hired on as a head mechanic up in one of the golf, higher end golf courses in Cleveland with a substantial increase uh, in in uh, their annual income. Yeah, there, there's there's just not people with this kind of training. I mean, a lot of the, the golf course superintendents are required to go out and pluck somebody from, you know, a diesel mechanic or automotive mechanic and then trying to teach them kind of this real grinding skill, which let's face it, there are, there are nuances of keeping real cutting units, uh, cutting high quality of cut, staying sharp, and then again, when you have poor after cut appearances, it just takes uh, knowledge that you won't get anywhere else unless you have someone like Gary who's able to teach it to you. Um, anything else you can think of there? All right. So why students choose Ohio State ATI? Um, and I guess even for me, why I chose Ohio State ATI. And, uh, this is a unique facility. Our mission is to learn by doing. And so not to knock other institutions, but I just see that there's a there is a shift occurring here. I think it's obvious that, and I don't know what you've seen from your experiences, but um, I have seen our students, they soak it up. So we, we give them these really hands-on opportunities to take a concept that may seem abstract. And all of you have learned these concepts that um, you think, I think I know what we're talking about, but it's not until you do it. Do you see it put into practice? And, and oftentimes, it takes putting these into practice four or five times before you begin to get some proficiency or true understanding of the skill. Um, and that's what we do. We, we basically deliver the content, often using a typical classroom scenario where maybe it's a lecture PowerPoint using, um, using various pictures and whatnot. But then in our laboratories, we are gonna go out and execute some of these practices. So here is an irrigation and drainage class, uh, installing some uh, some drainage in a bunker. But to, to kind of bring it back full circle, that's why students come here. We have so many students that are attracted by this opportunity of hands-on learning because um, I just don't think other places have, we're enabled to do this, one, because of our facilities. Um, so right on campus, we have a fairway, a putting green, we're developing a sports field. We have uh, actually two putting greens, two tees. Our grounds crew here, we have a lot of beautiful grounds areas and they work very closely with us, allowing our students to do drainage projects and getting experience on mowers. We also own Hawks Nest Golf Course. So in 2007, the Hawkins family donated an 18 hole golf course facility to us. So we're able to, we have a classroom in the basement of the clubhouse. We literally can walk right out in the grounds and go teach students how to spray, how to fertilize, how to show a student what happens when somebody grabs a greens mower and decides to go mow teas and, and just things that you would not be able to see uh, within the walls of the classroom. So great hands-on experience. And what I have seen is just that students make the mistakes with us because everybody's going to make mistakes and, and students make those mistakes with us or um, one thing I see in our industry sometimes is that people don't have the time to do maybe the level of training that we do. That's our job as instructors is to, to probably cover some of those details that many would say, 
I shouldn't have had to cover that. That seemed obvious. But uh, the reality is we see some of those students just don't have that knowledge. So uh, we're able to, to answer those questions, to head off, you know, simple things about don't open the chute of a spreader till it's moving or what happens if you tip the spreader over or, or, or little things. Fertilizer's got to stay dry. We, we hit on some of those basics that just do not present themselves uh, in a traditional classroom. So, so we have a couple of questions, uh, Zane. One is um, interesting question from Allison. What are Zane and Ed specialization in education and research? And what unique perspectives do they offer to the industry? So if you want to talk about yourself, Zane, there a little oh, bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess my background is I, I grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania, and I had a, a little lawn mowing business when I was 12. I remember my dad having to come start the mower for me, but I couldn't, when it was cold, I couldn't get it started. And so I, I started mowing lawns and then uh, started working on a golf course when I was 14. And I uh, worked at Oakmont Country Club for four years and then Bayonne Golf Club, went back to school and got some secondary education. I got my master's and PhD from Kansas State. My emphasis there was in weed science. Um, I'll preface, these are weeds that grow in the turf grass. And anyway. Um, so now I, I really study mosses as a big area that I study, uh, mosses and putting greens, mosses and, and lawn height turf. Um, when it comes to education, I guess as you would think about my philosophy, um, I have adopted this hands-on teaching philosophy. It's funny, I, I have used a lot of this hands-on education or experiential learning as it's known. Uh, Kansas State, I was not aware that it was really the mission of any institution, so it's just funny how things fell into place. And I, I honestly could not see myself teaching any other way. After seeing the, the benefits of it, seeing students, because one beauty for us is we will assess them. We're going to find out what they know. And the students learn the material. I mean, they learn the material. And so is, is there any better way to know that it's working other than that? So that's kind of my, I guess, background and, and how I feel about it. Uh, my background is a little bit broader in the sense that uh, obviously I'm not from Ohio. Um, from Ireland originally, went and did my undergraduate in England at Myers School College. Uh, as part of that, I did an internship through Ohio State. Uh, then ended up for a time back in Ireland. Then Australia, uh, then came to Ohio State to do my graduate education. And from there, went to Florida, up to Chicago, and now I've uh, returned back. So one thing I definitely tell the kids is, if this is something you want to do as far as travel and, and being in an industry that gives you an opportunity to work overseas and add value to your career. Uh, I may be an example. I may not be the best example, but I am definitely an example of how you can do this. Uh, with that, and, and Dan has definitely underplayed it, you know, we both have very strong networks across the industry, not just in Ohio, not just nationally, but internationally. Um, as far as my education uh, and research approach, um, like I said, in my master's and PhD at Ohio State, uh, I was focused mainly on uh, environmental situations of plant physiology with responses from turf grass plants in shade and UVB light not necessarily the most applied type work, um, but I've been able to correlate them into various situations on the golf courses. Um, I would say that the hands-on learning is critical to what we do here at API. The one thing that I like to enforce with the kids is getting a broad base of basic knowledge um, as far as a set of terminologies and, and understanding some of the basic components that they need. And so usually I'm the first hurdle that they have to jump across to me before they get to the famous Dr. Rose. And for any of our graduates, uh, they always look to see if our students have passed um, or completed their qualification, uh, if they pass Dr. Rose's classes, because that's a real indication as to whether or not they can go to the grinder and come out the other side. Um, but it's a, it's a definitely a, a, a two-step process uh, with, with Zane and then how he finishes them off with the hands-on learning. I'll try and give them a little bit more of a theoretical approach um, in the classroom to build them up before they go out onto the actual golf course. Uh, second question that came in there from uh, Maka was, is there a hands-on learning dirt work for pitchers, mounds, batters, boxes, and baseball, softball, infields? That's something that we don't really have much of. We, we need to fix that. It's funny, I was just having a conversation about this. That uh, that's, a, that's another piece when I meet with students that especially want to get away from the square sports or the rectangle sports and get into baseball 
is that they often see the designs in the fields. And I have to remind them that that is maybe where 10%, 5% of a you know, head groundskeeper's time is spent. We recognize that it's the infield, the pitcher's mound, the bullpen mounds, and the batter's box. And so to answer your question, um, no, that's typically things that we have seen on field trips, but certainly I recognize that we need to have some unique facilities here on campus to be able to teach that. So hopefully if, if we do this again, uh, maybe by September, October, we will have a place on campus where we're at least being able to do the, the batter's box and the mound component, um, the infield mix. Maybe we can get somebody to give us some funds and we can make that happen. But uh, we're, pretty, we're pretty fortunate we do have a, a baseball field right here on campus. So we will, we will continue to do some of that. So hopefully that answers your question. That's a good one. Other things too, you know, just to back up to the sports things, you know, my background was golf, and so uh, I do love all facets, and I'm really intrigued by the sports field piece. But another thing we saw was just basic painting skills, being able to give field dimensions and stripe fields properly. Simple things. How do you clean the sprayer out or the striper out? And so these are little things that as we get questions like this and recognize those are needs, we've, we're pretty dynamic. We'll, we'll integrate that immediately. So. So real quick, I just want to finish with this part and then we can hit the question. So what does this hands-on learning look like? Because you can throw this term around, um, but until you actually do it and, and see the learning, I, I don't think it comes full circle. So this is not what hands-on learning looks like at our institution. So um, you come to one of our classes, you won't be seeing any of this going on. So here's an example. So in the irrigation and drainage course that I teach, Students need to understand USGA root zone construction. It's a critical part of managing any type of sports field or putting green. Um, and so students need to understand what's going on below the surface so they can manage the surface properly. And so um, Ed and I will do this quite frequently where we have some research needs and we will integrate our classes into this because there's a learning opportunity, there's benefit for us. We also think it's important for students to have some under understanding of what goes on with research, what what contributes to push the field forward. So students needed to know all facets of, of USGA root, root zone construction. I thought, well, let's build a putting green. So uh, Ed and I needed a research green. So at a Hawks Nest golf course, we identified a site. Uh, we contracted uh, bulldozers. We brought in a D5 bulldozer and shaped it out. So our students had some time running the bulldozer. For those of you watching saying, why didn't the students do all of that shaping? I would say that if you have that argument, maybe you have not ran a bulldozer because I'll tell you that they are uh, an unforgiving piece of equipment. And so students had a little bit of time in there, but uh, most of the shape work was done uh, by a contracted operator. We had students running the track loader. Here they're out installing uh, our drain tiles, learning how to shoot grade, operate a trencher. Uh, just the little nuances that are involved there. Here they are laying in our four inches of pea gravel, wash pea gravel. I think this is an eight to nines. So we're getting it all feathered out. Here's the root zone mix. So I think we had 400 tons of root zone mix delivered. And again, the students are beginning to distribute the mix and then installing irrigation. So it's just a two inch, two inch PVC all the way around uh, with rainbird heads. And then we floated the mix in. So this is, this is pretty much where the students got to by the end of the semester. So unfortunately they didn't get to uh, get it completely wrapped up but don't worry, we took care of it. So we, we grew it in, and uh, this is kind of what it looks like today. So this is, a, again, another great tool for us where we can uh, get students to operate pieces of equipment with no concerns about harming anything. Students can scalp collars or, or make a poor application. There'll be no harm done to, to, to the golf course or any facilities. But that's just, I think, a quick example of, of how we kind of integrate this hands-on approach um, to it. And so. Some other quick pictures. Here's Devin uh, mowing the research green. Students laying a bluegrass sod collar around. There's my dog sleeping on the job. Um, students learning how to conduct an irrigation audit on the research green. So this is a way to determine precipitation rate, distribution uniformity. Here's uh, the, the gentleman we talked about that's now a uh, head equipment manager, uh, learning how to sharpen bed knives. This gentleman had never operated a piece of equipment before in his entire life before he got here. Uh, here he is learning how to, to operate a tea mower, fertilizing greens. 
here is a, you know, is there any better way to learn how to fix irrigation than just hop down in there and get it going? Here's uh, Dr. Nangle giving our roller a test. Students venting green at Hawk's Nest. Going to be some basics of application technology, et cetera. So. so we had two quick questions. One was, we don't, I, I don't believe so, but we don't teach students how to roll up a water hose after watering, watering an infield of green, or we do? I teach them how to roll up a hose and train a hose. Okay. So, I mean, is it on a quiz? No, but uh, teach them the basics of, at least when I get a hose, I lay it out, let it sit in the sun, bake out, and that it needs to be rolled up the exact same way every time because there's nothing worse than training a hose and having someone roll it up the opposite way. So that's how I was taught on the golf course. Uh, if, a, if the sports field world does it a little differently, um, then I would not be aware of that. But, yeah, students learn how to, to roll a hose up properly or train a hose is how I would call it. So good question. And then the second one was, is the students required to work out at the golf course or facilities outside of their class time? Mm. Are they required? No. But a majority of our students do work outside of school. Um, but no, we, they are not required to work. Uh, we've talked about, we have a practicum class that sometimes we use for students that need a little bit more development before their internship. Um, but no, they don't. And, and honestly, it's jam packed. I have concerns sometimes about students coming in, especially during their first semester. I tell parents this too, that I recognize sometimes there, there are financial constraints where somebody just, they, they, they financially need to work. And that's another story, but if it's one of those things where um, they just want to work to work, I really recommend that students get here, make sure that they can do the transition from high school to college uh, effectively. Worst thing I'd want to see is a student come here and they're doing the work thing well outside of school, but they're not taking care of business here in the classroom. Uh, to me, that's a, that's a really bad scenario. So to answer your question, yes, we have students that work. I don't recommend that they do it their first semester. So these are good, these are good questions. Um, if you have any others, fire them in. Um, I'm trying to think of a few wrap up things here, Ed. Um, One thing we didn't touch on, uh, although vaguely, um, with the internships, um, as it currently stands, the way the industry is uh, in desperate need of people, we're getting opportunities coming in from all over the country and all over the world. Uh, this summer, we were able to send students uh, Chicago, Maryland, over to Pennsylvania. They're in Ohio, uh, particularly northeastern Ohio. Uh, we also have students who've gone to Canada, England, Ireland. Um, and we've had in the past students going out to Nevada. Uh, also students, you know, who've gone out that far and then um, ended up in, in places like Wyoming, Idaho, and, and again, the alumni, they're all over the country and all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it really is a kind of a get up, can do, and go do it type of program um, where, you know, if you want to take an opportunity or create an opportunity for yourself, we will do all we can to get that opportunity uh, in place. Um, the other thing from my standpoint, the way I take the approach is, look, I'm, 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 this is a tough industry. Uh, moms and dads start asking about, well, the hours and, and, they, and, and, you know, lifestyle choices and all those things. And I'm straight up front. For people who are living up in the northern part of the United States, summers are going to be hectic. If you're going to be a person that wants to succeed in this industry, expect to put in some hours. That doesn't mean it's, it's, it's going to alter your life in the sense of you're never going to see anybody, but you are going to have to put time into it. When somebody gets a little bit inquisitive about that, I also turn around and say, look at it. If you want to be a successful chef, you want to be a successful lawyer, doctor, Whatever it is, you're going to have to put time into it. This industry is exactly the same. If you want to get to these top facilities, you need to put the time into it. Secondly, myself and Dr. Roddenbush bring a lot of passion, enthusiasm, excitement for this industry because we really believe it's a great industry to work in. We want the students to match that passion and excitement. If they don't, they're going to struggle when they get out there because the places we're sending them are looking for that hunger and excitement. Once they get it or see it, they are going to push and promote the hell out of these students and give them the opportunity to really succeed. But coming into us and sitting there with their two hands under their butt, it ain't gonna fly, right? We need the kids to be really involved. I think too, we hammer on the professionalism and communication component, especially because some of our students are, 
are going to be several, you know, many will graduate by the age of 20 versus some four-year degrees, 22, 23, 24. And so really trying to get students to understand that being professional, what does that look like? Let's just throw the word professionalism out there, but how you interact with people, understanding the importance of your social media pages or public knowledge, and to understand that um, what needs to be on there needs to be of, of good standing and not a picture of you doing who knows what. Um, but I think even a bigger piece that we see, and this is a skill that we try to develop, is the communication component. I don't think students have any idea how important it will be to um, have really good written communication skills, be able to shake someone's hand, look them in the eye, make a great first impression. Um, and I shouldn't say all students. Some students are really good at this, but this is a skill I would say that a majority of our students need to work hard at. Um, and so if you're watching this and you're a student, I would just encourage you to put yourself in opportunities to meet new people, to have conversations with someone you may not normally have conversation with. Uh, it's just a great, great opportunity to, to gain that skill because it's just one that comes with experience. Um, because let me tell you, you are in a profession where people don't know what you do. That's our profession. I mean, it's a, it's a unique skill set. So you have to be able to communicate why you're doing a certain job or a certain practice or why you need a certain resource. Often, many of your clientele are brilliant doctors, lawyers, you know, successful business people. These are very, very sharp individuals. So you got to be able to demonstrate that, that you are on top of your game and can put these technical uh, terms and skills into a layman so someone can understand it. And so it's just a it's an intangible skill that, in my opinion, it's what separates people as they move through their careers. I see a lot of people who are very, very successful agronomists, but being able to communicate that to people, that is the, that is the difference maker in terms of really wanting to climb up the chain. And then we also have students that say, I don't want to be that communicator. I'm a more of an introvert. And there are plenty of places for those people in the industry, too. Um, but the, especially you start climbing up the ladder, you want to be uh, hosting U.S. Opens or you want to be a, a head groundskeeper at an NFL facility, you're going to need to communicate and you're going to have to be good at it. So not to finish on a Uh, I think if there's any more questions or if there's not any more questions, we'd like to wrap it up and we'll hand it back. Yeah, to Liz, we'd, thank like, you. we'd like to preface this is our first time doing this, and so <laughs> we hopefully will get better at this as it goes. But we appreciate you making time to, to hang out with us today, and um, there'll be more of this to come. So, and if there's any more questions, you can email rodbush.2 at osu.edu. That's R A U D E N B U S H dot the number two at osu.edu. Or nangle dot one n a n g l e dot the number one at osu dot edu and yes there is only one of me you don't want any more thank you folks and have a good day go bucks.